in a much more serious way. Now if you begin to look at just the last decade, you see a soccer game with two halves. Great success generally through the period for the autom automobile trade. Strong demand for luxury products with the USA and the, U the EU leading that demand while China and other developing countries grew the demand enormously for meat and dairy products. Production continued to move to Asia. We'd seen that happening through the, uh, uh, through the 90s. And the consumers in the United States and the EU were delighted by seeing regularly lowering prices and they accelerated that trend actually to the point that our worldwide footwear and leather industry got quite surprised at the huge acceleration of manufacturing towards uh, uh, China. Um, China had previously dominated this white footwear market, but it began to pull in during the late 90s and the early uh, two, 2000s huge amounts of casual leather footwear uh, for the world uh, market and China's own domestic market, all these inner cities like Chengdu and Xi'an also began to, to grow. And in some of the bigger organizations, because China absolutely dominates uh, shoe factories making 20,000 pairs per day or employing more than 10,000 uh, workers. And they linked their tanneries to their shoe factories to get much more rapid delivery time and much higher levels of efficiency. And this kind of co coincided with a period where the Brazilian currency rose in value. And so many of the big global brands decided to go very largely, 90%, 95%, to a one country supply a policy of taking everything from China. And we reached a point during the decade where we really began to wonder if all the world's shoemaking, and along with, along with many other elements of manufacture of consumer products, was going to be uh, 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 done only by China. Now we've always known making a leather jacket or a pair of shoes was labor intensive. We'd always expected to see that moving around the world uh, based on, uh, on labor costs. And we had, and we saw that too, uh, expected that tanning would move less easily. It's more capital intensive, it's harder to move the big drums, drums around. One country which stood out in all this has been Italy doesn't have a huge raw material supply, it doesn't have a huge domestic market, but its tanning industry has been phenomenally sticky and been uh, capable of, despite hit after hit over the last 20 years, its tanning industry has managed to remain remarkably, uh, remarkably strong. So while China took two-thirds of all the world's footwear manufacture, it's only taken less than one-third of the tanning capacity in the world. And we see two phenomena related to tanning. One is, where will their customers be? The shoe factories, the car factories, or more importantly, the car seat makers. And the second, where will the raw hides be? And that's leading to some new configurations, particularly if where the raw hides are, there is a good setup to handle high volumes of waste material. So you see, on the one hand, quite a lot of tanning holding back to where the hides and skin supply are, and another group of tanning moving to where the shoe factories, the garment factories, and the upholstery users are. And we move a lot of leather about in pickle, in wet blue, and in crust. So there are many options in this dynamic for doing different bits of the process in different parts. 
And so with the US and the Brazilian hide producers actually now investing in tanning, and we're not quite clear what the motive of uh, this is. Is it a defensive one after the recent crisis in the economy, or is it a deliberate long-term strategy? But we are beginning to see structural changes in the leather industry that are of such a significance that perhaps they're only matched by the foundation in the United States in 1893 of the United States Leather Company when 200 vegetable tanners got to together to form what was the very largest company in the United States and one of the founders of the Dow. So this whole dynamic is moving at the moment very quickly around the world. But in the middle of the decade, China made some very big decisions about its own future. It was not going to accept tannery pollution as an inevitable consequence of development. And it didn't want to make forever what it considered to be low added value, such as low priced, low grade future uh, uh, footwear and garments. And it wanted to move up the value chain and make computers, motor cars and aeroplanes. These decisions gave rise to some quite determined legal moves and changes in in industry support. Now China's industry is very strong, even with this reduction in support. Its highly developed network structure, its high levels of labor efficiency, strong customer orientation, fabulous infrastructure and logistics, and benefits of scale, it can still beat the world hands down in, um, in, in, in many areas. So don't let me say that because China's changed its policy, it's going to be uh, overwhelmed. It does make 10 billion pairs of shoes, and its biggest competitors don't make 10% of that. So its dominance is phenomenal. But I do see that the speed of growth in the leather sector will slow, and the focus in China will become much more on its domestic market. In China, if you want to reach its domestic market, 2005, 80% to meet and sell to 80% of middle class Chinese, you had to have stores in 60 different Chinese cities. By 2020, that will be 212 Chinese cities, as China doesn't want to grow any more mega cities like Shanghai. I wonder how many Mexican footwear brands have stores in 60 Chinese cities right now. It's an interesting question. What this all did though, and these changes, is it changed the orientation of all of our thinking. Countries who thought that China was only going to give them crumbs in footwear and leather manufacture, now decided they could get serious and go for growth again. And we've seen some very strong growth in the last two to three years in Indonesia, where clients who'd left for China have gone back, in Bangladesh, in India, in Vietnam, and in Africa, we've seen it in Ethiopia, which is becoming a blueprint for sub-Saharan Africa. Each country with the leather industry began to re-examine its strategy in the light of what we can call a new optimism. And there are significant changes uh, still going on. And even now, although labor costs and costs in China um, are still, still rising, and Chinese shoe factories are struggling to find labor and are rushing towards the inland parts of China where they're hoping to see labor being a little bit cheaper. Now, of course, as we went through the, as we went through the uh, 20th century, the last decade, we were hit by another big impact. Excuse me. 